Let all the other names fade away Until there's only you Let all the other names fade away Jesus, take your place Jesus, take your place Let all the other names fade away Let 
deserve the praise. You deserve the praise. Oh God, oh God, oh God, we worship. Oh, we worship you. God, hallelujah. Jesus. 
But Philippians chapter 2 helps us to see that there is no name greater than Jesus. Jesus did for us, y'all, what we could not do for ourselves. He emptied out himself, gave his life on the cross for us to be returned to right relationship with God. So if you can't think of any other reason why you ought to let all other names fade away, that ought to be the reason. Because Jesus gave his life on the cross for you, died, was buried, rose again on the third day with all power in his hands, all for us to be in relationship with God. Now I know, right, you got a lot of stuff on your mind. I know, right, you have a lot of questions. I, I, I get it. But all other names, all other issues got to fade away. And you must place yourself, place your life in the hands of Jesus. Until there's only him. Press away, push away everything else. Everybody else in this moment and just focus on Jesus. Hallelujah. God, you're worthy. Hallelujah. We magnify you, God. You be glorified. Lord, you're perfect. Hallelujah. We magnify you. We make you big, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. You be glorified, God. You be great. Hallelujah. We make you big in this place. Hallelujah. Father, with our hands lifted, we worship you. We make you big. You said in your word, Lord, that the hour is coming where true worshipers must worship you in spirit and in truth. So today we make your name big. Hallelujah. We glorify you. We love you. We honor you. We adore you. Hallelujah. You're amazing, God. Hallelujah. We pour ourselves out at your feet, God. You be glorified, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, your word. Hallelujah. Father, as we pray, we ask you, God, to Keep us in a place to where our heart's desire is to give you glory. We beg you, Lord, to speak to our hearts today. God, we know that there, are, that we know in our mind, Lord, that there's no name greater than yours, but I pray that that truth will change our hearts. I pray that, that our focus, Father, will be to give you glory. I pray that you make us more like you. Father, I pray that our behaviors will line up with the fact that there is no name greater than yours. I pray, Father, that, that, that our ways will be drenched by the power of your spirit. Lord, contrary to what the naysayers think, we pray for a prophetic move in this moment. God, that we will be challenged by your truth. God, that we will be changed in a moment, in the blinking of an eye. God, that our only response will be to trust in you. Hallelujah. Restore our worship. Restore our trust in you, Father. Let us not, Jesus, be weary in well-doing. 
but I pray that you will rest here. That just as you've told us to abide in you, we pray that you abide in us. Father, we pray today, Lord, that we will make room for you. God, we filled our hearts and minds with everything else. But we pray that we make room for you. Father, we love you. We honor you. We adore you. We make you big, Lord, because you deserve it. You're holy. You are perfect, God. Thank you for being who you are, Lord. Together, not only do we worship you, Lord, but we also praise you. Because you give us the activity of our limbs. It's moments like this, God, that we long for. Moments like this that, that, that we hunger for you as the deer panted for the water. Our soul thirsts for you. Hallelujah. So God, in this moment, we declare your name great and we give you glory. We receive our worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate God together for his goodness? Come on, we can do better than that. Let's celebrate God together. Hallelujah. Give me a little value, please. Amen. Amen. I am, I am excited about Jesus, right? It's, it's, it's interesting when you begin to think through, right, that there is no name higher than his. And when you begin to reflect and you honestly confess the fact that all other names, Andrew, got to fade away. Right, the, the names, not that Jesus put on the pedestal, but the names that we put on the pedestal. Yes. Right, even putting ourselves on the pedestal, putting our own thoughts and ideas higher than Jesus, but together we confess, right, let all the other names yes. fade away until there's only Jesus. It's so great to, to be in worship with you guys today. One more time, let's celebrate Jesus today. Yes. Amen. Amen. I want to take advantage of this moment to welcome each of you here to Faith Community Bible Church where we exist to make Christ known in the community by caring for the community. Man, it's, it's amazing, um, Sister Bria, that with icy roads and all of that stuff, we still have the privilege to worship Jesus together, right? And I'm grateful for all who have pressed their way today. I also want to take a moment to celebrate God for the gullets, Mark and Leah, who's here today. Right? With baby Layla. Right? So good to see y'all today. Um, also, I want to uh, I wanna shout a happy anniversary to Andrew and Adria Metlin. Right? I, for, I forgot how long they've been married, but it's a long time. They starting to look alike. Um, but how long, Andrew? Twelve years. Oh, man, you got to catch up, partner. You, you behind. <laughs> Grateful, grateful to have you all here today. Um, today, y'all, we're going to continue in the Gospel of John. Open your Bibles. Let's go to John 15. John 15. I'm going to begin reading at verse 18. John 15, verse 18. And I'm going to read a little further um, than our opening text. I'm going to read all the way through chapter 16, verse 15. So, so we're going we gonna, to we gonna read it, right? I want you to lend your ears to it, lend your attention to it. Um, and we're going to get through this together, all right? John chapter 15. John chapter 15, beginning at verse 18. When you have it, won't you say, I got it? If you need more time, just say, I'm turning still. I'm giving you time. John 15, John chapter 15. Um, I'll begin reading at verse 18. John 15, beginning at verse 18. It reads this way. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor have they known me. But I've said these things to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not go away, the help, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. You can't handle it yet. When the spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father is mine. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he would take what is mine and declare it to you. That is John 15, verse 18 through John 16, verse 15. And the word of the Lord is blessed. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is a mouthful, right? But there, Jesus is having a conversation with his followers, giving them a warning. Giving them a warning. And that warning today is what I would like to use as a subject hated by the world, but empowered by the Spirit. Hated by the world but empowered by um, the Spirit. Hated by the world, empowered by the Spirit. If you knew that you were going to experience something bad, would you want to know in advance? How amazing would it be to know in advance that you were going to experience persecution, that you were going to experience hatred, that you would experience isolation, seclusion, or even backbiting. Wouldn't it be great to know that you are going to experience persecution, but you find out before it actually happens? How would you brace for it? Would you still be surprised when it happens? Well, believe it, there's something um, that I need to let you know. There's some information that I need to give you. Something that I firmly believe that all of us here should have known already. Now, knowing this, y'all, knowing what I'm about to tell you is going to fill some gaps in your thinking. Once I tell you this, Mark, things are going to start making sense to you. You're going to begin to understand why it's difficult for you to evangelize. When I tell you this, you're going to understand why right life seems to be so difficult for you sometimes. It'll help you to know why you are sometimes treated the way you are. What I want to tell you, believer, here it is, is that the world hates you. The world hates you. Just like the world hates Jesus, listen, the world hates you. 
The world wants you dead, believer. The world wants to take you out. The world hates you. You are hated by the world. And that's why everything that you do as a believer seems to be scrutinized so much. That's why, right, when you begin, right, to have conversations and talk to people about homosexuality, they don't hear you loving them, they hear you hating them because you disagree with what makes them comfortable. Let me tell you this. It's not true that believers hate people who practice homosexuality. That's not true. But the truth is homosexuality is sin, and uh, lying is sin, murder is sin, adultery is sin, fornication is sin. And when, when believers call out sin, the world don't like it because they're comfortable in what the Lord has delivered us from. The world hates you. That's why everything that we do as a church seems to be scrutinized by the world. That's why anything that happens to somebody who professed to be Christ, Fox 2 makes it big news not to let them know, but to really shoot at the church because the world hates us. That's why, y'all, the world doesn't extend us grace. That's why whenever you begin to talk about something other than what the world is interested in, they push you away. They want the church's stuff, but they really don't want the church. Because they hate us. Just like the world hates Jesus. Let me tell you, it hates you too. Don't be discouraged though. Don't be discouraged because the world hates you. Because although you are hated by the world, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you so much that he knew you would be hated by the world. So he empowered you with his spirit. And that's the main point today. Just like Jesus, um, believers are hated by the world, but we've been empowered by his spirit. Just like Jesus, believers are hated by the world, but we are empowered by the person and work of the Holy Spirit. See, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting to, to process how the world hates us. Let me tell you why, Sister Georgette, because we spend so much time trying to please the world. We spend so much time trying to please the world that we can't even wrap our minds around the fact that we're hated by the world. We spend so much time in our life trying to look like the world, talk like the world, behave like the world. We spend so much time looking for approval from the world. We incorporate ourselves in the world system so much so that we find it difficult to believe that that which we're trying to please actually wants to take our life. While the world hates us, we are still blessed, though, because we are empowered by the person and work of the Holy Spirit to represent Jesus in this world. Though the world hates us, we are to represent Jesus by prioritizing his righteousness above all, by exercising God's love, patience, and grace to all people. Let me stick a fork right there and let you know that the same people that hate you, God is empowering you by his spirit to serve. The same folks that want you dead, the same folks that's trying to take you out, the same folks that hate you, you are called to serve. You must show love and demonstrate to this world what it means to live a godly life by testifying to the world the truth about Jesus. That's why it says in our text, yes, you're hated by the world. But we empowered by the Spirit. See, Jesus, see, Jesus knew that after he left his disciples to return to heaven, they would face some difficult opposition. (coughs) He knew that they would face some some difficult opposition from the world. Maybe, maybe just maybe because he had just told them that they would do even greater works than he did in chapter 14. They were envisioning Receptive crowds and smooth sailing ahead. But the reality was they would face some severe persecution. They would, they would face um, some severe persecution, not just from the pagan world, but also those from the religious crowd. They wanted to, uh, the Lord wanted them to know what to expect from the world and how to respond to the hostility that they would experience. Let me share with you, family, that 
because you belong to Jesus, you experiencing hostility is something that you can't avoid. You will experience hostility from the world. Because you belong to Jesus, you will experience hatred. You will um, experience isolation. You will experience seclusion. Folks are going to talk about you. Folks not going to like you telling them the truth. But here's the thing. We are hated by the world. Our problem is not only that we're hated by the world, but because we too busy expecting pagans to live like believers. We expect the world to behave like Christians, but it doesn't work that way. The unbelievers are going to be unbelievers. So if unbelievers are comfortable being unbelievers, what if Christians began to be comfortable being Christians? Not trying to pursue things right of this world, but to really pursue Jesus. See, the world, from a Christian point of view, involves all of the people, the, the plans, the organizations, the activities, the philosophies, and the values that belong, here it is, to a society without God. That's what the world is. So, so some of these things may be cultural, but others may be corrupt. They may be corrupt, but all of them have an origin in the heart and mind of sinful man and promote what sinful man wants to enjoy and accomplish. But as Christians, y'all, we must be careful not to love the world or be conformed to the world because while Christians are in the world physically, we are not of this world spiritually. Jesus, Jesus here in his text pulls no punches um, Deacon Cortez, when he tells his disciples that their situation in the world will be serious and even dangerous. If you read this, there's this progression. Um, progression that happens in the world's opposition from hatred to, to persecution. And even in John 16 to excommunication and even death. And if you really begin to, to read the book of Acts, you can begin to trace the stages of resistance. That, because it happened in the early church. Just like Jesus, believers are hated by the world but are empowered by the Spirit. And as I read this text, as I read this text, there, are, there were two questions that came up, right, that I'm going to attempt to answer for you. Two very important questions that, that this text shows us um, that, that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to you and I'm going to unpack. One of the questions is, Okay, you're telling me, Jesus, that the world hates me. Well, why? Why does the world hate believers? It's the first question. And the second question that we're going to talk through is how are we empowered by the Spirit? I know that the world hates me, but why? But you're telling me not to be discouraged because I'm empowered by the Spirit. Well, I need you to help me understand. And today I'm going to unpack these. The first question that's answered for us here in this text is why? Believers are hated by the world. Let's look at the text. John 15. I'm going to read John 15, verses 15, verses 18, I'm sorry, through 25. Here it is. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. Let me pause right there and tell you that if the world loves you, you may want to check your pulse. He says it right there, if, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, what makes you think you different? If they kept my word, which they don't, what makes you think they want to listen to what you got to say? I mean, that's the Michael Standard Version. Y'all ain't got that, right? But, but think about it, verse 21. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have sinned and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. 
See, in verses, in, in, in chapter one, uh, in verses, uh, in chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, Jesus is having a conversation with his followers about being connected, remaining, abiding in Jesus. And as he shared with them about abiding, he takes the conversation a bit further and wanted them to know that, hey, I know you need to be connected to me. Yes, you ought to abide in me, but, I, I, but, but if you will remain firmly planted in me, yeah, you're going to have some joy, but you're going to experience some persecution too. Specifically, right, uh -uh, you're going to experience persecution specifically from those who I've instructed you to serve. Jesus says, the same people that I'm instructing you to love, the same people that I'm instructing you to serve, the same people that I'm instructing you to pray for, the same people that I'm expecting you to feed, the same people that I'm expecting you to clothe, the same people that I'm empowering you to witness to, the same people who knocking on your door, the same people who talked about your mama, the same people who bullied you will hate you but you're going to have to serve him anyhow. He tells us several reasons in this text why they'll hate us. He told us several reasons. First, we see in this text that they'll hate us because we identify with Christ. They hate you because your identity isn't like theirs. Y'all ever experienced, right, when you, know, when you got godly confidence, people tell you you're arrogant. You got confidence in Jesus. You're confident of the cross, right? You, right, right? you don't boast about yourself, but you boast about Jesus, and then folks try to tell you holier than thou. Oh, holier than thou, thanks. That's a compliment. I, I'm glad you see me being holier than thou. That means that I'm living godly. See, when we identify with Christ, when we embrace our new identity in Christ as believers, we communicate to the world that its systems, its morals, its way of doing things is wrong. I don't know if you paid attention to not Sister Tracy, but the world hates to be wrong. The world hates to be wrong. Here's why, Jerry. The world hates to be wrong because they're full of pride. They're full of pride. The world takes comfort in believing that they are the best thing since sliced bread. That's why they tell you stuff like before you can love anybody, you got to love yourself first. That, that, let me tell you this. That's so much foolishness. Because Scripture doesn't tell us to love ourselves first. Scripture gives us the idea that we already love ourselves too much. Right? So, so when your identity is in Christ, come here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he a new creature. All things pass away. All things are made new. The world hates you because they still stuck on who they used to be, but God has created you and made you new. Folks coming at you crazy and then acting surprised when you don't respond the way they think that you should. They didn't even want to, they, they didn't want to talk to you, say, so they told you this because they was waiting for you to pop off, but because you said amen, now all of a sudden they don't like you. They don't have any excuse. They have no excuse for not liking you. They hate this word hate in this text, right? The, 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 the word hate in this text, right? comes from a word, missio, that simply means love less. They have no reason to love you less. They just don't like what you're doing because you're confident in Jesus. They have no reason because your identity is in Christ. The world hates being wrong because it's full of pride. But when we identify with Christ, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourselves with Christ. He tells us in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you all are one in Christ. Paul helps us to see right there that your identity is not your past. Your identity is not, oh man, I'm about to get voted out with this one. Your identity is not found in your gender nor your ethnicity. It's an issue when you make yourself black before you make yourself Christian. It's an issue when you take pride in being white more than you do take pride in the Christian. It's an issue when you take more pride in being a Democrat than you do being a follower of Jesus. Let me tell you this. 
Republican, Democrat, African American, white, none of that is the fruit of the Spirit. Therefore, our identity is found in Jesus. So, so because our identity is in Christ, we're hated. We're hated. Paul in Galatia, when he talks about being one in Christ, right, he's speaking to the Christians in Galatia, reminding them that their identity, since they place their faith in Jesus, is in Jesus. Let me tell you this. Your identity is in who or what you place your faith in. So if you place yourself, if you place your faith in yourself, then you identify with yourself. But I made myself mad, Nikki B, right? So I've decided that I'm just going to place my faith in Jesus, right? To be baptized into Christ, what Paul talks about, means that they were identified with Christ, having left their old sinful lives and fully embracing their new life in Christ. See, to be in Christ means, y'all, we've accepted his sacrifice as payment for our sin. Our rap sheet, here it is, our rap sheet contains every sinful thought, attitude, or action that we ever committed. No amount of self-cleansing can make us pure enough to warrant forgiveness in a relationship with a holy God. See, the Bible says that in our natural sinful state, we are enemies of God. But when we accept Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, he switches accounts for us. So my rap sheet now is turned from killer to convert. My rap sheet is now turned from sinner to saint. My rap sheet, while before it had bars, now because of what Jesus did on the cross, I made new. I identify with Christ. Identify with Christ. See, if you identify with Christ, it's simply saying that a divine exchange takes place at the feet of the cross for our old sin nature and gives us a perfect one. If that don't make y'all shout, nothing will. Right? To enter the presence of a holy God, we must be in, right, in the righteousness of Christ. See, listen, to identify with Christ means that God no longer sees our imperfections. He no longer sees our imperfections. He well, well, when he look at me, when I'm in Christ, when I identify with Christ, if he don't see, if he don't see my imperfection, what does he see? When Christ looks at you, he embraces you because he sees the righteousness of his son. He sees the righteousness of his son. Hallelujah. He sees the righteousness of his own son. See, only in Christ is our sin debt counseled. Only in Christ is our relationship with God restored. Only in Christ is our eternity secured. Yes, the world hates me, but I've been empowered by the Spirit to live with Jesus and not the world. The world can hate me all day, but my identity is in Christ. The world hates us because in Christ... We see, see, let me tell you, in Christ, we see and acknowledge our sin. We see our sin. We acknowledge our sin. But the world pursues perfection and find themselves trying to eat their own passions. Right? Think about it. The world is evil gluttons. Well, the world eat a lot of food. Yeah, so do we. But the world eats what makes them feel good. We see our sin. The world doesn't. It's interesting that while we see our sin, Christ doesn't. Because he took it to the cross. He looks at us and sees his righteousness. The world hates us because we identify with Christ. Not only does the world hate us because we identify with Christ, but here it is. This text shows us that the world hates us. This world hates us. Listen, because we've been called from among them. We've been called from among the world. Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. The world hates you because God chose you. See, when Jesus calls us to himself, he calls us out of something to someone, right? He called us from the ranks of rebellion to become a part of his family. See, he called us into relationship with him. It isn't because we are something special, but it's to demonstrate his love for us. He chose us out of the world um, because it puts his grace on display. Well, pastor, why did he choose me and not the other person? I don't know, but he chose you. 
He chose you because he chose to. Let me tell you this. God does not have to explain to us why he chose us for a relationship. And I ain't going to beg him. I'm just glad that he did. Right? I, I wonder if we, what would happen if we began to shout on being chosen like we began to shout on these income tax checks coming? I wonder what would happen if we began to shout on being chosen like we do getting a car with low interest rate. See, because I think that we, we, we expect God to do something extravagant that we look at being chosen as something so, so minute. But no, being chosen by God is a big deal. We're running around looking for miracle after miracle, going to prophetic line after prophetic line. No, the greatest miracle is that he chose me. He chose us out of the world. He chose us not because we were special but to put his love and his grace on display. Let me tell you this, church, there's nothing that we can do to be called, but when people see us leave the fellowship of sin and join a community of believers, they're going to respond in hatred. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Oh, so you've been duped by the white man, right? You can, you, can be, you can be jacked up and think that Christianity is a white man's religion if you want to, right? But all through Scripture... Right, when it talks about Asia Minor and all that stuff, right? Hey, you may, you may want to look at a map, right? Don't, don't be duped by this world. God chose you not because you were special, but because he chose you. He chose you, and when people realize that you chose him by God, they're going to respond in hatred, but people who are not confident in who they are, they ain't going to hate you to your face. They're going to hate you behind your back. People who ain't people, people who don't have the confidence that you have, that they ain't gonna stand there and talk to you about it. They're gonna leave. They're gonna leave you, right? Simply because they don't have the power to stand against a powerful God. Right? When he called us, he made us a part of a gifted, unique, godly group of people called, watch this, the church. The church. And and what, what makes it amazing. Not only because he allowed us to be a part of the church, but what makes the church so amazing is how he describes it. It's how he describes the church. Watch this. Second Peter, I mean, First Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you, watch this, out of darkness unto the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Why? Because you are a holy, a, a holy priesthood, a chosen race, a holy nation. Well, let me tell you this. When people begin to tell you, know you're God, right? Say, I know because I'm a royal priesthood. Like, what if you began to walk in that confidence Resting in you being royal, you being chosen, not because of what's, what's in you, but because of what he chose to do. He, he chose us to be a part of the church. See, here's the deal. When God calls us out of the world, he exposes the darkness of the world to the world. He exposes the world's darkness. That's why 1 Peter says he called us out of darkness into the marvelous light because light is the element that destroys darkness. And the more and more we operate in our Christian identity and be a light in this dark world, it will expose the world's darkness. The more and more the darkness of this world is exposed, you'll begin to see that you are called to be different. There's no way, right, a city on a hill can be hidden. God didn't light you up for you to put, a, for you to put a, a basket over your life. No, you're called to be different. You are called to represent Christ in this broken world, and the more you represent him, the more the world will hate you. Listen to this. The world, the world system functions. The world systems and its functions are on the basis of conformity. As long as a person follows the fads, fashions, and accepts the values of the world, they'll get along. But the moment that the Christian refuses to be conformed to this world is the moment that the world will begin to persecute you. What am I saying? I long to be persecuted for loving Jesus. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? The world wants you to get along with them to accept what they do. But let me tell you this, genuinely converted, blood-bought believer, you are called to be different. You are called to be different. The Christian should refuse to be conformed to this world. As believers, we are a new creation, and we should no longer want to live that old life. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. But a dark world does not want light, and a decaying world does not want salt. In other words, the believer is not just out of step. But when we are conforming to the things of this world, not only are we out of step, but we out of place. Whenever you are surrounded, David, around sin, things that God hates in order to make you uncomfortable. The moment you as a believer become comfortable hanging around things that you know God hates, the things, right, that this world enjoys, it ought to make you so uncomfortable. So either number one, you say something, or number two, you leave. You ought to be uncomfortable being sucked in by the things of this world. You are either out of step or out of place. I don't like either. So I know that the world hates me, therefore I'm going to always represent Christ and not conform to the things of this world, but allow my mind to be transformed by the word that my heart may respond to the things that gives glory to Jesus. 1 John 2, one of my favorite books, says this. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father but from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away. But the one who does the will of God remains forever. Family, we can't continue to chase the world's approval. Why? Because the world hates us. They hate the fact that we identify with Christ because it proves that what they enjoy is fruitless and void. They hate us because we don't want to enjoy what they enjoy. Calling us a square, right? Telling us we weak or we whack because we don't want to do what they want to do. The world is spiritually blind. The world isn't honest about its sin. And the more we pursue the things of God, the more it pushes the world uh -uh, to see that it's lost its flavor. Just like Jesus, believe it, you're hated by the world. But don't be dismayed, family. We're empowered by the Spirit. Just like Jesus, believers are hated by the world. But we, the church, are empowered by the Spirit. So number one, the first question is, why does the world hate me? Because you identify with Jesus and you've been chosen from the world. You've been pulled away from the world. But number two, second question, here it is. Well, how does the Spirit empower the church? Or the better question is, what does the Spirit empower the church to do? It's a better question. But I, but I get it, though. I get it. You're saying, well, pastor, I shouldn't love the world. I hear you. But I enjoy the things of the world. I shouldn't, but, but can I be honest with you, Pastor Mike? I enjoy the things of the world. Those things that you're telling me I shouldn't do is so fun to me. Why should I stop doing it? Why should I stop having premarital sex? Because I like the feeling. Why should I stop lying? I lie because I don't want to get in trouble. Why should I stop drinking? It's so fun. It's so relaxing. Why should I stop smoking weed? Because there's nothing like feeling laid back and eating up food I ain't buy. Why should I stop doing the things of the world when it brings me so much delight? Why should I stop doing the things of the world when it's so fun to me? It's so enjoyable. I'm going to tell you why. You must stop doing the things of the world, number one, because if you love the things of the world, it shows that you don't love Jesus. But number two, you ought to stop doing the things of the world because the Holy Spirit empowers you to be different. Well, it's hard to stop. It's hard to stop. Well, let me tell you this. Not only it, it's going to be difficult for you to stop when you'll never surround yourselves around genuinely converted believers who are going to hold your arms up when things get weak. But if you continue to surround yourself around the same friends who turn up every weekend, the same folk who all they do is spend their bill money on weed, if all you do is keep on calling that girl late at night, talking about Netflix and chill, you're going to keep falling. 
but you have got to make an honest decision to yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, what does yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit looks like? It means surrounding yourself around people who love Jesus more than they love you. You got to be comfortable not being the hero of every story. You got to be comfortable confessing your sin. Well, what does the Bible say about confessing sin? He says that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're empowered. We're empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you're going to get strength to turn away from things that you enjoy that you know is not good for you. We all do stuff that we know is not good for us. Like... We all do, but we got to get to a place in a position that we begin to surround ourselves with people who are going to hold us accountable. Let me tell you this. While I'm here, just let me tell you this. People can only hold you accountable to what you confess to them. If you're struggling men in your flesh, it's going to be hard for the men around you to hold you accountable to it if they don't know, right? Let me tell you this. You're going to need more than a Friday night game night to hold one another accountable. It got to be some time around the table with the door open, or I mean with your Bible open, with people. And you actually confessing, man, it's old girl at my job. It's these one jeans she wears. She don't need to wear them no more. You got to be honest about what makes you weak. Be honest about what makes you stumble. Holy Spirit empowers you not only to confess your sin, but to surround yourself around other people to help you walk out this Christian life. God didn't create you for you to be on the island, church. He created you to be in community. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be different. Each of those things, believe it or not, of this world alters your thinking. It alters your behavior and causes you to think unclearly and make unwise choices. How do you stop? God, by the power of his spirit, will strengthen you to overcome the habits of this world and enjoy uh, and give you a new enjoyment in him. I'm going to tell you, I got diabetes. I do. And as of lately, can I confess, it's been breaking my heart. It's been breaking my heart to a point of there's a possibility that there was a possibility one day that I may have had to go to the hospital because my sugar was too high. I didn't know what was going on. I I can't sleep at night because I'm frequent to the restroom, but I just can't rest well. So when I finally found out what was going on, I had to confess that to my wife. It was hard. And one day she was talking to me, hurt my feelings so bad. She hurt my feelings real bad, but I'm going to tell you what. If I don't confess the issue and I continue to let people make me sweet potato pies and pound cakes and continue to eat all Tyler honey buns, I'll never grow past it. Right? But I had to confess. I had to confess to someone. God, let me tell you what God is doing in this process, right? Because I don't need the sugar. He's he's renewing my taste buds. He's causing me to have a taste, but like, 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 I, I'm talking about 36 years of fried chicken, honey buns, and cereal. All I got a taste for is corn pops. Gotta have the pops. All I'm, a, I'm a black preacher. I love me some fried chicken, right? But the Lord is changing my taste buds so much so to where not only do I have to surrender that to Him, but I got to make sure that I have the strength to push the plate away. If it's something that I don't need to eat, I have to push it away. Let me tell you, I'm confessing that not only to y'all, but those watching online so y'all can stop bringing fried chicken to the Wednesday dinner. The thing in it, right, is that God, like, like it's interesting that we believe God enough to give us new stuff, but we don't believe God to give us the strength to push away the stuff we don't need. He empowers us with his spirit to say no to those things that are not giving him glory. His spirit will strengthen us to overcome habits of this world and have a new enjoyment in him, right? I told you all before when I was youth past that empowerment, right? We had, um, there was a kid at our church, a kid at our church in our youth ministry, right? He was deaf, right? He was deaf. Um, so Sabria, everybody talked, right, except for him. So my role, my responsibility, David, was to find a way to reach him Right, find a way to reach him so that he wouldn't feel left out. 
So one of the things that we decided to do was we brought in um, somebody who was fluent in sign language, right? And as they were fluent in sign language, we said, okay, we need to know how to say the church name in sign language. The church was empowerment, Sister Georgette. So, so when she told us, she made a muscle. And she said to say empowerment in sign language is to make a muscle, take your strength, and give it to the other person, right? So what am I saying? That's what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. That's why we need one another. It means that I need Andrew because I need him to make a muscle and give me his strength. I need Chris Hill because if it was up to me, I would quit. But I need strength. I need to confess where I'm struggling to people so that I can have their strength and keep walking out life. It's the only way this works. Holy Spirit empowers us. He empowers us. When he calls us out of this world, away from the people we sin with, he puts us with a family that we can grow with to pursue godliness with. God did not call you out of the world where you're comfortable and tell you, okay, now you be at home by yourself. He called you to be in relationship with people. That's why he called you out. He puts us with a family that we can grow with and pursue godliness with. He strengthens us. What does he strengthen us to do? He strengthens us. He, he, he strengthens us. He empowers us to tell others about him. He, so, he shows us that in verses, in, in chapter 15, 26 and 27. When the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. You also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Think about it. He didn't leave us with this task, this huge um, task to accomplish on our own. But Jesus promises reinforcements. He promises um, strength that's much more stronger than our own. He promises us a helper, a paracletos, a parachute, an advocate. He promises us the counselor, Holy Spirit. The promise of his spirit will empower his followers to tell others about him. He will help us speak the truth about his son. The spirit of God will be sent from the throne of God to empower the people of God to witness about the son of God. The spirit of God will be sent from the throne of God to empower the people of God to witness about the son of God. Well, pastor, I hear you. I know I'm empowered by the spirit to testify about Jesus, but what will I say? What if they say this? What if it goes this way? What if? What if? What if? Well, let me tell you this. The more you know about God, the more you will have to say about God. The more you learn of God, the Holy Spirit can bring to your remembrance. You don't have to be discouraged or focus on what you may forget. Because you are a follower of Jesus, you must testify about Jesus. Let me tell you this. My short-term memory, Leah, is shot. But when I'm having a conversation about Jesus, I always got something to say. Listen, to testify about Jesus requires honesty about sin and a willingness to be rejected. Nobody enjoys rejection, Mark. We guard our feelings. We, we guard our friendship all to prevent being rejected. We tend to cut off things or get impatient when it seems to be headed for rejection. When it comes to testifying about Jesus, let me tell you, you got to embrace rejection. For so long, we've allowed rejection to cause us to be quiet. The fear of being hated and rejected by the world is really a hunger to be accepted by the world. God has empowered us with his spirit so that we won't stop testifying about him. Don't stop witnessing. If you've been silent, start speaking now. If you've been silent about Jesus, start speaking now. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, the counselor, to help you share the truth about him. It's through the testimony of the believer. Let me tell you this. It's through your testimony that the Holy Spirit convicts the world. If the church does not testify about Jesus, the world will never be convicted of its sin. I know, I know you need scripture. So, I mean, I know y'all studious. Let me give you scripture, right? John 16, 5 through 11. But now I'm going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asked me, where are you going? Yet because I've spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. 
Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I'll send him to you. When he comes, say when he comes. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin righteousness and judgment, about sin because they don't believe, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. The Spirit uses witnessing Christians and the Word to convince unbelievers of his sin of unbelief, of his need for righteousness, and of the fact that since he belongs to Satan, he's on a losing side. God uses you to do that. If you don't testify about Jesus, how can we expect the world to change? There is no salvation without spirit-led conviction. The spirit uses the word to convict lost souls. And, and believer, if you don't know the word, how can you share it? Holy Spirit empowers us to testify about Jesus. After this, I'm done. Here it is. The Holy Spirit you empowers us to testify about Jesus. But l- l- last thing I'm going to say. Listen. Holy Spirit empowers believers not to stumble. Not to stumble. Watch what he says in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. I told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogues. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I told you these things so that when their time comes, you will remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. See, Holy Spirit empowers us to live a holy life. He's telling us this so that we won't stumble. Well, Pastor, you telling me that I got to evangelize, that I got to witness, and you telling me the world hates me, but, but you, you think I got to go back to the same people that I used to turn up with? If you don't, who will? If you don't, who will? The Holy Spirit has, the Holy Spirit has given you the strength not to stumble. You won't fall if you trust in Jesus. See, the difference between then and now is that you was trying to go back by yourself. But now God has given you a new family to introduce to your old family, somebody to stand with you when things get tough. He empowers you, empowers you so that you won't stumble, so that we won't fall into the traps that this world has set for us. He says, man, they're going to ban you from the synagogues. They're going to try to kill us for thinking, and, and, and they're they going to try to kill us thinking that they're doing a service to God. Let me tell you this, right? Why do y'all think that, the, 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 that they have st- they're, they're getting to stop giving tax breaks to the church? Because they're trying to end the church, the, right? That, the, like, like, that's why all these things are happening. The world is so against the church. They're trying to ban us from doing things that we know we shouldn't do. I was reading an article the other day where there's this senator in some other state He's presenting, presenting some, some bill that is going to force the church to use gender-fluid language. Well, we can, well, there are certain, he's saying there are certain things that you can't say. You can't say brothers and sisters because you don't know how they identify. Right? Here's the deal. They hate the church. Now, I wonder why they're trying to govern what we do. But it's interesting, right, because we serve in a country that heralds one nation under God when God ain't got nothing to do with their decisions. But the Holy Spirit empowers us to remain faithful on what God said. He empowers you. He gives you the strength to stand firm where you are so that you won't fall to the things of this world. Holy Spirit empowers us not to stumble so that we can be aware of this world's persecution. Just like Jesus, believers, we are hated by the world, but don't be dismayed because we are empowered by the Spirit. Why does this world system, including the religious world, quote-unquote, hate the Christian, the one who believes in Jesus and seeks to follow him? Because we take comfort, we take rest in our identity in Christ. They hate us because we identify with Christ. The world hates believers because we've been called from among them. We've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light. 
The world hates the church because it reveals to them the darkness that they love so much. But family, you ought to celebrate today because you're empowered by the Spirit. You're empowered to be a witness. Well, I'm afraid to go back into those circles because I don't want to be tempted. We go back into these circles of new creatures. If we don't pursue them, who will? We've been empowered by the Spirit not to stumble. Holy Spirit didn't just come in your life to give you an ah, bye, bye and a sha sha sha. Holy Spirit came in your life not only to bring to your mind and to your heart the importance of the Scriptures, but to change your behavior. Holy Spirit empowers you to live for Jesus. We've been empowered by the Spirit so we won't stumble. But Pastor, you said a lot. What does this mean practically? Three things, practically. Here it is. Number one, don't love the world. Don't love this world. Believer, where does your affections lie? If your affections lie in the position that you just want to please the world, then that means you love the world, that you need to check your focus. Don't love the world. See, the longing of the human heart is to, is to be loved and to love. The objects of our affection need to be rightly ordered if we are truly to find ultimate and lasting satisfaction. John commands us, I said it in 1 John, don't love the world or the things that belong to the world. Why? Because to love the world is to not love the Father. And that's who we really need. We need the Father. Practically, don't love the world. Here's another thing, number two. Make time to learn about Jesus. The world is going to constantly challenge your belief. They're going to challenge your thinking. They're going to challenge your belief, right? But the more you know about God, the more you have to say about God. The more you learn of God, the Holy Spirit can bring to your remembrance. You don't have to be discouraged or focus on what you may forget. You are a follower of Jesus, and you must testify about him. Practically, don't, don't, not only should you love the world, not only should you make time to learn about Jesus, but finally, surround yourself around more and more genuine believers. Who do you hang around with? Who are you confessing sin to? Who are you making yourself accountable to? One of the problems, y'all, in the church today is too, many, is too many Andrew the blind leading the blind. We make ourselves accountable for people who ain't going to bust our head, but we make ourselves accountable to people who it's going to be easy going with. Because don't, no, don't nobody want to don't, don't nobody wanna hear that they wrong. We just want to, it's okay. You're not a baby anymore. It's not okay. It's not okay for you to keep saying the things that you say and do the things that you do. If you are a believer in Christ, it's time for you to grow up. We cannot, let me tell you this, you, you a grown adult, you ain't still eating Gerber. You got to grow up. Surround yourself around more and more genuine believers to keep you accountable so that you don't fall back into your old habits. Yeah, it's true. The world hates us, but we're empowered by the Spirit to live for Jesus. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're wrestling with. I don't know, right, where this hits you. But understand this. The hate that the world has for you ain't going nowhere. That's why Jesus empowered you with his Spirit, though. Because while the world isn't going anywhere because it's fruitless and void, you're going higher in Christ. And you must put yourself in a position to where you can keep growing in Christ, no matter what this world does, no matter what decisions Trump make, no matter what they decide to do in St. Louis City. You must rest in Jesus, knowing and understanding that he holds your life in his hands. Yeah, we're hated by the world, but we're empowered by the Spirit. Let's pray. Jesus. Truth be told, Father, um, a lot of these things shared today, Lord, we already knew. We already knew that the world hated us. We already knew, Lord, that things um, shouldn't always go the way we want them to or won't always go the way we want them to. But I pray, God, that you would give us confidence in knowing that our identity is in you and not ourselves. I pray, Lord, that we will rest in knowing, God, that you have 
chose us from the world to be in relationship with you. So I pray that you will give us new footsteps, God, so that we won't continually run to what you've pulled us from. I ask you today, God, to let us rest in the empowering of your spirit. Not only, God, you giving us a counselor to help reveal our hearts to us, but I pray, God, that we will not continue to, to hide our sin from brothers and sisters who love us dearly. I pray, God, that you will prophetically speak to us who we need to be accountable to. I pray today, God, that you will help us to know, Lord, who we need to invite ourselves into relationship with. Because, yes, while we know that you have given us your spirit, we also know that you've given us one another. And I pray today that we won't hide behind our experiences. I pray today, Lord, that we won't be conformed to the things of this world, but that will be transformed by the renewing of our mind, knowing full well, Lord, that we have the responsibility, God, to live for you and not ourselves. As we respond to you today, God, speak to us clearly. Let us trust in you. Let us lean and depend on you, God, knowing, Lord, that you hold this world in your hand. We love you, God, and we thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen. Amen. Listen, as we respond to the word today, our worship team, our worship team will come at this time. And listen, it is true that we're hated by the world, but we are empowered by the Spirit. And as we respond today, believer, you ought to worship Jesus.